When drawing to the bad, I consider this to be where the adaptation becomes structurally mired, unfaithful to its source material, and generally lacks that certain je ne sais quoi of a special and memorable epic, or with on echelon coordination between its weaving narratives, even more prominent is the lack of balance given to proceedings. To begin with, what did Ronald F. Maxwell intend here? Was this meant to be a Thomas J. Jackson biopic, or an adaptation of Jeff Shara's 1996 novel of the same name? So much energy is focused upon the character of Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson and Stephen Lang's performance. But this feature, and if intent on being a biopic, frankly underwhelms when seeking to explore the history of this peculiar individual. Referring to Jackson's military achievements, it's curious to say the least that there's little to no coverage for what would become Jackson's most career-defining campaign. That being Jackson's Valley Campaign between March and June of 1862, where he comprehensively defeated and repelled Union forces from the Shenandoah Valley through a myriad of tactical victories utilising audacious, rapid and unpredictable movements. Or even at Harpers Ferry, where he forced the capitulation and surrender of over 12,000 Union soldiers for the loss of a few hundred of his own. No photographs. In essence, and if intent on further exploring this character in the form of a biopic, there's just so much wasted opportunity here. Granted, this wasn't covered in the novel either, but the novel didn't spend nearly so much time on Jackson as the principal character. He was just one among a main cast of four point of view characters, two from the north and two from the south. We also receive nothing about his humble upbringing, working and teaching at Jackson's Mill, about him falling out with his sister, a staunch unionist from Harrison County. Even more curious, if intent on exploring what I coined the uglier part of this adaptation, where the argument has frequently arisen that this feature leans too heavily into a lost cause narrative, why not then explore the controversial nature with how he conducted a Sunday school, and likely in violation of state's laws, where he sought to educate enslaved people. Mr. Jubal Early. May I call you Jubal? I haven't any intention here to champion the lost cause, and will note he's still elected to fight for the preservation of slavery, but this certainly highlights the complexity of interpersonal and racial relationships during that time. It would have proven an interesting offering if a biopic had now become the intent. We could have received further exploration with this character into the construct of his beliefs rather than, well, what we got. What is the status of your family? About half is free, half slave. That's counting all the cousins and such. Jim, you must know that there are some officers in this army who are of the opinion that we should be enlisting Negroes as a condition for freedom. That's what they say is round the camp. Your people will be free. One way or talk. I mean, is it possible he'd have believed this? Yeah, it is possible. He was not the typical Confederate general, nor did he have the expected close ties with the aristocratic planter class. Why I could concede it possible is with his flexible thinking and through his friendship with Richard S. Yule, his most trusted division commander with considerable idiosyncratic tendencies himself, described as having the features of a bird. Early as 1862, Yule would propose to Jefferson Davis the enlisting of African Americans into the army to bolster their numbers. I believe it unlikely you all would have proposed this without having already discussed at least the possibilities with Jackson. Like I previously said, the perfect candidate for lost cause mythology. Even with the novel, where Shara doesn't delve into the implications of confederate causality in respect to the subject of slavery, understandably, the narrative would quickly become a bloated mess, seeking to focus on too much and therefore cover too little. Shara was clearly most interested in weaving a narrative around the few prominent generals' views from both the armies of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac, navigating the various battles through a specific individual's perspective, using point of view chapters where we receive some of the machinations that would prompt actions taken at the likes of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. Having said that, to give life and context to these individuals, during the earlier chapters, Shara did at least provide some insight into Jackson's personal tragedy, where he lost his first wife in childbirth. We would learn of his recent struggles with his faith, where he sought to visit his mother's gravesite in search of answers, and to somewhat rekindle what he'd felt was now lost to him in respect to a close connection with God. Even the mention of these personal moments and challenges offers insight into the strength of his conviction to his faith, and 
even how he, like many others of that time, could seek to rationalise even slavery as a good thing or a necessary evil. The rest is in God's hands. Amen. It presents the protagonists as more human, complicated, highlighting their hardship, making them somewhat more relatable despite the difference between modern day and Victorian era morality. Further, and with reference to Robert E. Lee, the novel lightly covered the financial challenges he faced upon returning home to Arlington and the Custis plantation, of him feeling disconnected and estranged from his family having experienced long absences in service to the army in Texas, of the increasing disability and ailing health of his wife Mary. The novel also showed cases the tragic nature of how Lee sought to somehow make up for his absences from his family through the forging of close bonds of friendship with those under his guidance amongst the army of Northern Virginia's higher command. In essence, creating a pseudo-family and resolving to find a new sense of purpose. Lee was a complicated individual also, referred to by a few historians as contradictory, notably a man of great strengths and great weaknesses. And what did we get? Well, sweet Fanny all. Oh, you get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! One common complaint in respect to the portrayals of Jackson and Lee is with how stilted they come across, somewhat inhuman with preachy dialogue that often sounds jarring. Although this is equally prevalent in the novel, it's understandable that this would prove off-putting, even alien-like to general audiences. But more importantly, the movie lacks these more human beats to the personal challenges each individual faced. Why, thank you, sir. But I must confess, sir, that thing that bothers me about this job is the absence of an audience. When you do it right, no one knows you're doing it. The depiction of both Lee and Jackson comes across as too pristine and sterile, effectively rendering the characters as mostly unrelatable and more reminiscent of bronze and stone statues. Moreover, and to clearly point out the obvious, the title of the movie is Gods and Generals. No way! Yes way! We get to follow the exploits of two principal Confederate commanders and a unique pairing I'd comfortably argue as among the best of this era, but what of the Union? Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, to this point, meaning no disrespect, was only a colonel. That I never served. I've never served with a better man. I mention how I see the reintroduction of Buster Kilrain and Thomas Chamberlain as merely fan service when speaking to the good. But I also somewhat see this with Chamberlain in both the film and the novel alike. His inclusion feels more like Shara paying homage to his father's work, The Killer Angels. Why does Chamberlain otherwise receive so much attention? And aside from nostalgia, did we really need the return of Jeff Daniels and the 20th Maine? It made more sense with Killer Angels and its specific focus on the Battle of Gettysburg and the engagements at Little Round Top. But here? Let me kiss your dear lips, precious wife. Let our hearts worship together God's love and wisdom and mercy. Even so, and while Jeff Shara also uses Chamberlain as a point of view character, he does achieve more of a balance through General Winfield Scott Hancock. In the novel, I personally found Hancock, or Wynn, to be the most interesting point of view character to follow. Why you ask? For starters, stationed in California, we gain an understanding of his own sentiments toward the conflict by seeing close friends such as Lewis Armistead and Albert Sidney Johnston side with their home state, abandoning the Union. This only adds to the potency of showcasing this as a conflict between friends, brothers and family, leading to what we'd receive with Gettysburg, and more specifically the performance of Richard Jordan as Lewis Armistead. I would like to speak to General Hancock. Do you know where General Hancock may be found? I'm oh, sorry, sir. The General's down. He's been hit. No. Not both of us. Not all of us. Please! God! <laughs> Hancock also offers some balance from the Union perspective between the desire for emancipation and the preservation of the Union. Hancock would later contest for the presidency in 1880 on the Democrat ticket. In short, he was a war Democrat. Like many senior officers and soldiers in the North, he was not an abolitionist by any stretch of the imagination, and would even encounter his own controversies through the Reconstruction period while serving in New Orleans. From a narrative perspective, he makes for an intriguing point of view character to draw contrast with between him and Chamberlain. Sure, I'll kick it up a fuss about Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Oh, it says here that enlistments are down and desertions are up. Any grumbling among the men? Well, not in our regiment. I mean, there are a few wondering out loud about why they should be risking their lives for the darkies. 
Well, Tom, you know my position. I signed up to preserve the Union, but I think the president did the right thing. What's the use of uniting the country by force and leaving slavery in place? <laughs> It'll sure rile up those Johnny Rebs. I mean, they're going to think all my Lincoln incited the slaves just to rise up against them. Well, why shouldn't they? Freeing the slaves wasn't a war aim when this all began, but war changes things and sorts things out. We also gain an understanding of the turbulent carnival ride that was the command structure of the Army of the Potomac. We receive exchanges with the well-liked McClellan, who had great strengths for administration and strategy, but could do nothing with them to tactically utilise what he had a significant hand in creating in the field, but squandering one opportunity after another. Then there's the not-at-all-liked blowhard that was the foolhardy Pope, then the inflexible and bumbling Burnside, and finally the polarising, even unlucky, fighting Joe Hooker. He didn't like that nickname, by the way. I also liked how he would share exchanges with other frustrated generals such as his direct superior Darius N. Cooch and the resigned to his fate Edwin Vo Sumner. With the film we basically get nothing other than a few Hancock lines including those that were Sumner's in the book and that made a lot of sense when coming from an aging general who saw his career crashing to an abrupt halt with the inevitable failure that would be Fredericksburg. The thing is we'll be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and say we're good soldiers we did what we were told. And if we're not successful, we can say, well, it was a good plan, but there were contingencies. And you, General, can go back to your hometown and tell the families of your men they died doing their duty. Beyond the more human elements and the balance presented through Hancock and Chamberlain, there were also the more humorous aspects within the book and made specifically in criticism of Burnside's command during the infamous Mud March. An excerpt from the book. Chamberlain walked toward them, stepped down off the surface of the road, and his feet slid suddenly away, slipped sideways into the depression that ran beside the road. He caught himself, one hand landing hard in the wetness, and Ames saw him. The other man said something something laughing then rode away chamberlain looked at Ames, said just a clumsy fall general these uh, roads are a bit of a mess no they are not colonel i have just been told that officer was colonel markey of general griffin's staff these roads are now ideal for a new and glorious advance of this army that is, in so many words, part of General Burnside's orders. So, Colonel, you see, you did not slip in the mud. There is no mud. Chamberlain said at Ames, heard the bitterness. Something new. Looked at his hand again. The handkerchief. No, sir. No mud here. I could go on ad nauseum how the novel's better. Although, as an aside, and with the exception of a single chapter, where we receive a point of view from Oliver Otis Howard, a general known as the Christian General due to his deep evangelical piety, and who was uniquely the genuine article supported by the radical Republicans as a true believer in racial equality and emancipation, even taking charge of the Freedmen's Bureau in mid-1865. I wish we'd received more here, and he seems a perfect counterpoint to the pious Jackson, even if his 11th Corps, comprising mostly German-American immigrants, was horribly routed at Chancellorsville. Specific to the movie, and with consideration for the more ill-advised creative decisions that took place, and if deviating considerably from the novel, Oliver O. Howard would serve as the perfect counterpoint to Jackson, and as a more fitting character to the title Gods and Generals. Coincidentally, he also lost an arm in service during the Battle of Seven Pines, surviving, and he somewhat recovered his reputation for both Chancellorsville and Gettysburg when relocated to the Western Theatre of War, replacing James Birdseye, cool middle name by the way, McPherson, who was killed during the Atlanta campaign as commander of the Army of the Tennessee. My main issue, at least in reference to the bad with Gods and Generals, is with the desire of a more balanced offering. And, particularly with the movie, it would have been much appreciated and would lead to a more thought-provoking narrative and exploration of this important history. Have I also mentioned how horribly bloated and ill-paced structurally and narratively Gods and Generals proves to be? Unlike Gettysburg, that focused on one major engagement of the American Civil War, where we come to understand some of the errors made by certain commanders. My fault. I thought that we were invincible. Of the disagreements over strategic and tactical decisions. You're strewn with boulders. The soldiers up there are entrenched all over the ground. And their guns and the rocks. Every move I make is observed. If I attack as ordered, I lose half my division. They have to come from miles away and their cannon will see every move. Hell, their cannon are looking down on us right now. 
in the center, they would break. Sir? Of the triumph from collective acts of bravery and sound leadership. Thinning out to twice the present distance. Now you see the colors, the colors are going to end up down to the extreme left. When you reach that point, we're going to refuse the line. Understand? We'll form new line at right angles. We'll pull up as much of a reserve as possible. We've got to be able to counterattack whenever there's a hole. Is that clear? Any questions? No, sir. Fine, move. And to the tragedy of losing close friends and comrades. In earnest, what do we get from gods and generals? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Well, maybe that is hyperbolic. <laughs> See him, sir. No, sir, I won't. No, sir. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the tree. Aside from Fredericksburg, although limited, we receive little to no tactical insight into the battles within Gods and Generals. It simply glosses over each battle while highlighting only a few signature moments, like the cornfields at Antietam. <laughs> Jackson discovering Howard's exposed flank at Chancellorsville. General Lee, I hope as soon as practicable to attack. I trust that never can providence will bless us with great success. Or standing firm like a stone wall at first Manassas. Look, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here today and we will conquer. Rally behind the Virginian! Yeah. To sound a broken record, the book more effectively showcases the horror. Request permission to return to the rear, sir. Permission granted. Permission granted. The desperation notes of the technical challenges in the field and highlights key determining factors of strategy. Specific to Fredericksburg, we come to learn of Jackson's irritation with Ambrose Powell Hill, an otherwise and generally excellent division commander, although frequently incapacitated with poor health, who made a noteworthy blunder here, leaving an exposed gap in the line. This gap in a swampy area would be promptly exploited by Union General George G. Meade's division. The book then expands upon Jackson's restless efforts on horseback to recover the situation and maintain his lines from being overrun. With the movie, it's as if Jackson's not even present. They have agreed to serve under the command of a Kentuckian. I have often wondered the same. The scene with him casually talking to John Bell Hood and of him talking over the formation of his placed corps is all we get. General Lee, we've constructed a road behind our lines running for the entire length. We'll move troops as is necessary. If the enemy penetrates our lines at any point, the reserves, Tolliver and Early, can move rapidly from their position to a new one, sir. You could argue, there's your tactics. Happy now? But we then don't see the result. There isn't any showcasing of cause and effect. Compared to Lee and Longstreet over Pickett's charge, this just falls completely flat. I going to need your help, Pete. I'm so bad. Tired. Moreover, and specific to A.P. Hill's mistake, would this not have been a good inclusion within the movie? How Jackson generally performed at Fredericksburg, of his fatigue and vulnerability having to swiftly shift and march on command his entire corps from the Shenandoah Valley in support of Lee, of his growing frustration with subordinates. We like to see our protagonists challenged, seeking to overcome adversity. At least some form of growth would have been nice to see through this transformative conflict. This Jackson does come across as just a little too evangelical. As I highlighted during the good segments. There's something to like here with this movie, but that doesn't keep it from being a notable disappointment. It reminds of the title to a book I've recently read about Longstreet's Knoxville campaign, titled A Fine Opportunity Lost. That title could summarise this movie and for any hope of receiving this trilogy's conclusion adapted. Beyond the lack of detail with relation to the battles, we then get one meandering narrative after the next, through newfound characters not meaningfully present in the novel. Shara achieved a more focused offering, concentrating on four point-of-view characters, along with a couple of supporting point-of-view chapters for the likes of William K. Barksdale during the urban combat of Fredericksburg, and Oliver O. Howard and Jeb Stewart at Chancellorsville. Seeing this adaptation takes more the form of a Jackson by 
biopic, it being a fair mistake if not believing that Chamberlain, Hancock and even Lee are also ensemble cast members, and not limited to those who interact with Jackson either, we get Reverend Junkin, Reverend Jenkins and his son, Private Pogue, Private McClintock, Martha and her family, Jane Beale and her family, Jim Lewis, Captain Alexander Sandy Pendleton, Dr. Maguire, Reverend Lacey, The Irishman, Jane and Catherine Corbin, Gilligan, the skipper too, the millionaire and his wife, the movie star, the infamous John Wilkes Booth, and of course Hattie. <laughs> The long and the short of it. Did we not already have enough characters through the novel? Beyond jumping through the hurdles of multiple battles, then having proceedings grind to a halt with Virginian civilian life, The pace of the narrative is all over the place. What about politics, and for the historian or enthusiast for the cause of each side? Well, if you'd like to hear the cause of the war at least repeatedly from the southern perspective and without much mention of slavery, we do receive a hefty share of that. While I highlighted this and specific to Lee and to Jackson as among the movie's good points, it just doesn't seem to let up. If the Republicans lose their little war, they are voted out in the next election and they return to their homes in New York or Massachusetts or Illinois fat with their war profits. If we lose, we lose our country. And then becomes more of a vehicle for the lost cause sentimentality of a jubil early. It is in this respect where we receive the uglier aspects of this adaptation and cinematic offering. I earlier spoke of a lacking balance and perspective between representation of northern and southern participants militarily, but this becomes a whole different story when it comes to the exploration of ideology and causality. This one's not even a West Point, so you want to watch him. He's a politician from Virginia. Jimmy's only here for the boat. Speak of the House of Virginia, Colonel. Matter of fact, Colonel, I'd like to talk to you about some political matters oh, if Lord. I might. 